You're listening to The Edge with Mark Thompson. An episode for you that includes a drill down on the election. We'll talk about what happened, what didn't happen, what's going to happen, the relevance of Donald Trump in the months and years to come. And then Jared Yates Sexton, someone who's written some great provocative stuff through the years. He's a professor, he's a journalist, and he's an author. And his latest book is American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World But Failed Its People. And there's a lot there in the title. You can pretty much figure what it is. But he goes way beyond the basic myth of American exceptionalism, goes back to the founding fathers. We take a walk through history in our discussion of what's in the book, including the Reagan years and that whole myth around Reagan conservatism and, you know, Reagan Republican, all of that. And then the legacy of the last election. So it's sort of a state of the state, but also how we got here. And as I say, Jared Yates Sexton is a sharp guy. I really think you'll enjoy the conversation. We'll start our look at the election and where we are in America with J. Elvis Weinstein, comedian and documentary filmmaker, and political analyst Michael Shore, and then Jared Yates Sexton on American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World but Failed Its People. Since the pandemic, I haven't hit you for money, but a couple of you have emailed and said you're still using the Amazon link on our website. So if you are ordering anything through Amazon, you don't have to. I mean, you, <laughs> but if you're going to do it anyway, I mean, it's a jillion dollar company. Somebody's ordering through them. Uh, you can do it on our website, edge-show.com. Anywhere it says Amazon when you open up an episode or whatever, if you click on that link, it's the same Amazon as usual, but they spin off a little something. It helps us keep the lights on. Otherwise, I no longer ask you for money. I think times are just too tough right now. Now during the uh, the period of COVID-19. But uh, again, so enjoy you checking out the show, subscribing, and being here. And let's get started. This is The Edge. The advantage, it means. Hey, look, I just spit on me for no reason. That's horrible. Is there some comfort in uncertainty, do you think? You're a degenerate. Because Australian shepherds need action. Wow. Yeah. This is The Edge. That's a self-loathing term that I use. For oh, got it. Really cool to have the band back together. You know him from Thought Spiral, the wildly popular podcast that he does with Andy Kindler. Jay Elvis Weinstein's here. Wow. Yeah. Hello. Jay Elvis is uh, Zooming, which is the what the kids are doing now. There are going to be yes. more Zoom Thanksgivings, apparently, and holiday celebrations than you know ever could have been conceived of. So he's yeah, joining us via I Zoom. I think that's fun for none of the family, I think, the Zoom <laughs> Thanksgiving. Oh, well, yeah, so it's a typical Thanksgiving. Then. And Michael Shore joins us from the road. Mr. Politics. How are you? We're well. How are you going to do Thanksgiving, boys? Are you going to Zoom some aspect of it? I mean, are grandma and grandpa Zooming in? or You know what I mean? Are like uh, parents Zooming in, family members, or are people going to try to wear masks and show up in person? What's the plan, Michael Shore? I'm finally actually going to show up at your Stragglers Thanksgiving, the year that you're not allowed to. Uh, no, I usually, uh, I usually do a big I, I, Thanksgiving is what Michael's talking about, a couple of days after the actual day. And uh, Michael usually does not come. Uh, and Jay Elvis doesn't either. usually not here. Michael's, Michael's back east with family usually. This year, I'm not, I haven't even planned it. I don't. You know, there's, I don't know what my work schedule is. I don't, there's a lot still in play, but I guess it's got to be dealt with. Yeah. How about you, Jay Elvis? Uh, we're going to do a uh, skeletal family Thanksgiving, and I don't think we're going to actually gather at the, ta- you know, we'll be masked until eating time, and then I don't think we'll actually all gather around the table to eat. Sounds awesome. That really sounds great. <laughs> that does sound like fun, yeah. yeah. What kind of music do you play at something like that? <laughs> uh, taps. Mostly taps. <laughs> Come on, Jay Elvis Weinstein's back, motherfuckers. <laughs> oh my god, that's great. Boy, it does feel like it's a kind of it's a grim year to celebrate or to get together, you know? Yeah. Right. Just to get into some politics, and we can talk about the election in a second, but just because we're talking about COVID, the strategy on COVID from this incoming Biden administration is directly the opposite of Trump, right? Trump was, let's not talk about it. And when we do talk about it, let's talk about how, you know, we're beating it. It's amazing. We're doing tremendous. Actually, the numbers are deceiving. The ones you're hearing from the media aren't the ones you want to focus on. You want to, et cetera. Like, explain it away. PR it away. And of course, numbers are now setting records in, for infections, for hospitalizations, all the rest. My question uh, is um, uh, about the Biden administration, which is leading with the science and the scientists. You know what I mean? They're going the opposite way. Transparency. Tell the people the truth. 
let them know the real threat and the ways to avoid it. I've always felt like that was the better way to go. I don't know. In the end, it'll be more successful. But Well, you weren't alone. I mean, five and a half million more Americans seem to think that than think that the Trump plan was right. So that's really what Biden's victory was based on to a large degree. Uh, and because of that, uh, you, you know, you get what you ordered. Uh, there's nothing going to be curative here, but they're certainly dealing with it in a way that everyone, you know, going back to the spring felt it should have been dealt with. And so it's not a surprise, but there is something certainly reassuring that in, you know, fewer than 70 days, we at least will approach this in a, a way that could make it better and, and leave behind a way that just didn't. Yeah, the guy can't keep the White House safe from COVID. Yeah, exactly. And, you you know, Mark, you were talking about what, what Trump has done and, and, you know, and said that it's going to be cured and said that it's gone. This is a man whose ascent was predicated on pointing out fake news and whose demise is defined by the fact that he shared fake news about COVID for the better part of a year and lost the presidency. So I guess in a sense, uh, he it's the live. Well, we lost him, but I'm betting he's going to say live by the sword, die by the sword. Right, Jay Elvis? Something like that. Some sort of ironic you, twist. Do you have me? Do you have me? Still? Now I've got you back. Finish your sentence. Right. In essence, it's... I want to know where the money was. Was the money on when I said live by the sword that I was going to go into die by the sword? Well, obviously, if when you said live by the sword, we'd know, but we didn't actually hear that. We just heard... So, really, it's live... We didn't even hear the live, did we, Jay Elvis? We th- I thought there might be a petard involved. I didn't know. <laughs> well, it was... If I can rewind myself, I said it's the old live by the sword parable. Which I'm not uh, even sure is a parable, but whatever. I don't think it is. I, I don't think Jesus yeah, got yeah. into the whole sword thing. So let me review. Hang on. If you went live by the sword, die by the sword, do you still get credit? Or because you said live by the sword parable, you didn't say die by the sword. So people who were guessing you were going to say die by the sword should not get credit. Am I right? I think all tickets are refunded here. Oh, okay. I think that's true. <laughs> <All right. laughs> You make a good point at the essence of all of that, which is that, you know, he's slamming out the fake news while he's calling the other news that's actual news fake. Well, that's right. But if the point is, the real point that I was making was that he, his success was based on that in in a campaign in 2015 and 2016 that was centered on pointing out the fakeness of American media and the news. And the reason he lost, I think we can safely say, is that he perpetrated this lie about COVID and and there was so much falseness to what he was sharing with yeah. America that he lost the presidency. And even now, his legacy will be that because he's talking about a rigged election, which we are quite confident the experts are, was not yeah, he, the case even a little bit. Yeah, he finally overestimated the stupidity of even his base for the first time at the wrong time. Yeah, I agree with that. However, I don't think we should underestimate it either, because I think, you know, when he does concede, it's probably going to be wrapped in a box that also contains, I can't wait for the rematch, and I'm going to have a rematch. Already, the water's been poisoned by him having said that it's a rigged election, that enough people believe that now because he's saying it and they agree with him and believe him. That's already happened. And I think that There's something very dangerous in that. And it's not just dangerous for the country. I think it's really dangerous for the Republican Party. I think they're going to have a hell of a time trying to figure out what to do from here. I think so, too. And I think him putting his personal pin on 2024 at this point is only going to turn the Republican Party against him faster. Yeah, no question. And it's it's going to be a crazy election anyway. Yeah, I, I would say, yeah, well, I mean, and the, the partisanship, I mean, I understand we talk about partisanship, but the cleavage between Dems and Republicans, and I use those sort of as broad defining political parties, it's never been, I shouldn't say never been greater, but in, you know, in my lifetime. Before you completely discount or talk about the fact that even his lies were too lieish, even for his own constituency, or that his blowing sunshine finally got to the point where it just didn't work on all those people who had supported him, he did get a record number of votes votes. It's just that Biden got an even bigger record number of votes. So I don't even know that his constituency turned on him, although you could certainly say, look, the pockets of suburbia that turned on him, there's certain demographics also that turned on him. I guess maybe that's what you're saying. I am. And I think that you also have to define who his constituency is. His constituency wasn't the group that needed to turn. I don't think people that voted for Donald Trump, who had either been, you know, Obama voters in the past or 
or reluctant Republicans who just didn't like Hillary Clinton or Democrats who did. I don't think those could be considered Donald Trump's constituency. And to that extent, I don't think his constituency flipped on him at all. And I don't think they will. And I think that's the danger that Jay Elvis and I are talking about is that they are not going anywhere. And that can really hurt the Republican Party. But I do think that the ones that you mentioned, Mark, the, the, whether it was suburban women, whether it was increased turnout among black Americans in an election, they didn't think they could get that kind of turnout. I think, you know, those are important things to look at. And Democrats, the, the lesson they need to take is they have to address Latino voters in a different and more serious way. And I, I don't know that they really have to do that in an emergent way, because I think that what was harmed most by Joe Biden being off the campaign trail was probably Latin outreach. And I think that would obviously change once COVID is in the rearview mirror. Do you see the spread of COVID and its effect on the economy, you know, small business, restaurants not coming back? I mean, but there are many small businesses that just are now with increasing COVID numbers, infection rates and hospitalization rates. There are increasing numbers of businesses that are going to have to shutter completely and will not come back. The relief packages associated with the initial blast, I'm talking about augmenting uh, unemployment and this kind of thing, uh, that's all expiring. How do you see that being played out on the political landscape of a new administration? I, I mean, if you're asking me, I think they're not going to get a relief package out of the Trump presidency. I don't even know that either side is really going to try. Steve Mnuchin and Nancy Pelosi probably didn't even come as close as it seemed. But I think that the Biden administration is going to work very closely with the House. And I think that, you know, Biden's strong suit being a relationship with the Senate, certainly I don't think it's a slam dunk, but I certainly think it has to make you more optimistic. And look, even though the Congress went more Republican than many had thought it was going to do, including me, I think that the lessons learned here are that Donald Trump was repudiated for inaction on COVID. And I think Republicans know that. So they're going to have to do something. So I think there's going to be something done. It will be too late for so many people, but I think it's going to be different for sure. It's weird that Trump is, you're right, not rushing to get any COVID relief plan through. But this, as of this recording just today, Trump to rush drilling leases in the Arctic before Biden takes over. You know, federal leases are contracts, so they, they're they very tough to rescind once they're issued. So it's not like one of those things where he can just Biden issue another executive order and make it go away. He's pledged to block oil drilling in the Alaskan refuge, you know, but uh, this was a promise and is a plan by this administration, the Trump administration, to get this kicked off. I mean, it's a one and a half million acres of the coastal plain in Alaska. So he is in a hurry to do some things. And I suspect that, Michael, these next couple of months are going to be a wild ride with other stuff he's going to rush through. I'd imagine. I mean, look, he's, we know he's a spiteful man. And we know that the motivation behind at least the very first part of his presidency was to undo anything that Barack Obama had done. And many would argue that it's because Barack Obama made fun of him at a dinner. You know, so losing an election, being a sore loser, part of that is is being spiteful to the person who who beat you. So it's not surprising this is what Donald Trump's going to try and do. And so I think it can come in all in all ways, shapes and form. But I also think that, you know, to me, the scariest thing, if you want to say anything scary, and I'm, I should point out that I'm terribly scared of this, but the thing about which uh, we should be most aware is if he does something with Iran, if he does something militarily that leaves Joe Biden in a real in a really tough spot when he takes over on the international scene in some way. It's funny what he's done. Trump, I mean, it's literally his decision to do all of these various rallies, which are clearly super spreader events, and they've traced back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases and even deaths to his rallies. Yeah. Those rallies expose the Secret Service to you know so much, so he's you know infected them to, to the level that he has. He's mm -hmm. one of those guys who does what he wants to do. You know, the takes on Trump before he took over, you know, I'm struck by this, Jay Elvis and Michael, that, you know, the sense was he doesn't really care. He's looking to make money. I mean, I think I really felt that, that he's just sort of an empty vessel and he'll be perfect for all these lobbyists and others who just want to move in, rewrite legislation, defang the government. Bannon essentially wanted to pour out the government and he did. I mean, when you looked at look at many of these federal agencies now, they are shells of what they used to be. EPA, Interior, Justice. He has his well, own agenda, state, Trump. It way, might be confused, it, but he has his own. Go ahead. Yeah, the State Department, too. I don't don't think it can be overlooked. All of our diplomacy is, you know, is shot. There are ambassadorships that were never filled and real ones, not ceremonial ones, that were never filled at times when we needed them. And so I just didn't want you to gloss over that. 
I don't know if that was worth interrupting for, but it's important. No, it's, it, was, it was worth it. Yeah, exactly. No, I'm glad you interrupted. Now it's uh, diplomacy by tweet. I mean, it really seems as though it's that. Yeah, and I think it's going to be vastly different. I don't think we're going to get tweets from the president. I don't think Joe Biden is going to spend very much time. I'd say even less time than Barack Obama spent bad-mouthing the Bush administration that preceded him. I think that Joe Biden is going to try and just take all focus away. This is how I would advise him if I were in that White House. Just take all focus away from Donald Trump completely. Just don't say his name. You know, we all who follow this stuff know how he feels about the previous administration. But I don't think he and I don't think he burnishes his uniter image um, by, by doing that. And I think it actually will help people just to ignore Donald Trump. I think that's a right. hard thing to do, though, Jay Elvis, you know, because Donald Trump's going to turn thing up to the do, heat. But it's not, it's not a hard thing to do for Biden. It's a hard thing to do for the media. But Biden's right. already doing the job. You know, I, he, I don't know that he mentioned his name since he's been elected, you know. I, think, I, just, uh, I, I just don't know, Jay Elvis, how much more Trump is going to foul the water on his way out to the point well, that I the mean, stench I think, I think, is going to make think, require a comment. Well, I think that, you know... The tool that he can use is when Trump becomes an enemy of the Republican Party more than he already is, you know, then he can do it to curry favor with the Republicans he really has to do business with, you know. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, that's exactly that. That was actually better than taps, if you want to know the truth. (laughs) (laughs) My smart comes out in a lot of ways, my friend. (laughs) you got to always have your radar on with Jay Elvis around. Apparently it does. But that that's exactly right. And, and then the Republicans have to themselves have to dance around it. Him holding up 2024 is so underratedly poisonous for that party and their quest for power from where I stand right now that I think that that's going to be the most powerful thing. And Biden doesn't even need to say Trump. It's the Republicans that are going to have to figure out what to do with it. Right, so I give agree. me another second on that. You're talking about him just talking about a 2024 run. Yeah. And trying to impact his tw- Twitter account isn't going to go away, right? It, unless, you know, something happens in the legal system where his electronics are taken from him. But I think, you know, he's still going to be when a senator does something against the Republicans, uh, he's going to tweet about it when he might direct a lot more of his ire against Republicans than he does against Democrats. He'll still take it out on Nancy Pelosi. But, you know, he, he could go after a weak need Kevin McCarthy at some point if that's how he perceives things. And it could really decimate whatever it is they're trying to do strategically for 2022 and 2024. Because his only motivation is to keep the glare of the spotlight on himself. He doesn't have a political philosophy that he's actually protecting. So he can be contrarian on any number of things because his gut tells him right. to and- that day. And it puts Republicans at a huge risk of having to repudiate something that that former President Trump is saying and then hurting themselves because he goes after them and his minions, if they are still part of a coalition, will go after that person. You know, so it's yeah, because if Democrats don't take the bait, he needs someone who will. Right. Exactly. You know, as we finish up, I just have two things uh, related in part to what you've just said, one of which is the Russians I was reading may actually be happy that it's the end of the Trump administration and the beginning of a Biden administration. As much as we think about the Russians being supportive of Donald Trump and Trump in the tank for the Russians and the Trump administration being controlled by the Russians, the predictability of a Biden administration for the Russians, they actually may value more than the unpredictability, which is kind of what made me think of when you talk about, like Jay Elvis says, you know, he just based on his whim may go against, you know, even something that he had said just an hour earlier. They feel, this is suggested by many scholars and those sort of inside that Russian ecosystem, they feel that Trump, between his unpredictability and the lack of a lifting of sanctions, you know, he hasn't lifted the sanctions quite the way they'd hoped. Those two things actually point to a greater optimism about a Biden administration. That seemed weird to me. Yeah, but that is weird. You'd think that Oh. Operated pretty much. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You dropped out for a second. Was that live by the sword, die by the sword, Jay Elvis? Do you you have me, guys? I've got you now. Go ahead. No, no, what I sensed what you would think, which is why you said it and why it's interesting. But you would think that that any kind of Russian behavior, the Russians behave with impunity during the Trump administration. and, And that 
you know, that goes away a little bit, I would imagine, with Biden. And I don't know how much of a motivator that is. Look, when they went into um, Ukraine and they did all of those acts of aggression, that was a lot of it under Obama. And there was uh, some degree of impunity, but there were sanctions and there was calling out and the Hague was involved and all of that. But I don't I, I don't know that uh, it's too soon to say. And we don't really kind of know what motivates them anyway. I guess it's too early to say, but it's an interesting prediction. I'll remind you that it was Sting who said the Russians love their children, too. It's, it's, remember that. <laughs> very, very good. Got it. I don't know. Well. I don't know if it's applause worthy, but thank you. I don't think so either. I want to finish with a point about the election. You know, all I heard, and frankly, I heard it because I was saying it a lot of the time, was the election, we are so vulnerable to outside interference, manipulation on social media, hacking through cyber manipulation. It just felt as though with all that talk and a lack of money from the federal government and a stout defense of the election systems. It felt as though we were going to have some major issues. Yet, I was just reading a piece, I think it was today, from a bipartisan board that reviewed the elections and from international observers. It was They call it the safest election in U.S. history. So, yes, yeah, from the soon-to-be-fired NSA uh, <laughs> spokesperson. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Couldn't really catch the last word because he was being loaded into a van. That's right. 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 Yeah. And, and bravo to the post office. Right. I mean, you know, these things, when they get a lot of attention, very often when the attention's finally paid to them, things are done about it to, to, to secure that. And I, so I think um, it's pretty amazing. But at the same time, so much talk about it probably really impacted the way it was dealt with. And that's impressive. Yeah. I mean, the, we talk about uh, the Y2K bug as being this sort of hoax but what it really was was a bunch of people scrambling to make it so that that's the right. world didn't shut down exactly that's true and that's what you know that's what this ended up being so that's kind of great michael is there anything that you want to mention places people can hear you see you besides kgl radio on fridays when you join me on my show up there in san francisco yeah, well, i i I appreciate that, Mark. I'm on News Nation now, and News Nation is a, uh, it's on in uh, 75 million American homes between 8 and 11 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. It's three hours of straight ahead news at a time when the other networks are offering opinion. We just report what's going on out there. And I will tell you that they take that part of it very seriously. Every script I write for every story I do for them is vetted not only by someone who's an English major, but by somebody who analyzes it to make sure there isn't too much bias or any. Do you get any notes back on your scripts, Michael? Because you're very well spoken and you can write very well. And uh, I wouldn't think that there'd be any issue with accuracy. You get a lot of notes back from this? The notes I get are mostly from the bias person. But, uh, but... it, it's uh, but they're not really. It's not about the construction of the scripts themselves. But it's a novel thing that they're doing. That, that it's on Next Star channels all over the country. WGN was a super station, which if you watched Chicago Cubs baseball, you saw. I am new to this venture. The venture is new to America. It's called News Nation, and um, and you will see my unbiased script. Yeah, Jay Elvis. Where can people drink in more of Jay Elvis Weinstein? Ah, uh, well, since my Twitter account is currently hacked, I won't plug that. Wait, but wait, it, wait! This is what, breaking what, news. What? what? Yeah, it's been this is outrageous. It's been almost two weeks since someone took over my uh, Twitter, and uh, luckily they oh aren't my. posting publicly, but they've been DMing people, phishing things. So. Are you kidding me? This is this is breaking Twitter news. Has, Twitter has not responded. How, how do you <laughs> complain to Twitter about that? How do you contact uh, You file a, you, what they call a ticket for uh, a hacked account report. No, I've been retweeting you more over the last couple of weeks than I have in my life. What the? <laughs> One of my great pleasures is Jay Elvis's tweets for real. He's so well, I'm, funny. I'm, I'm, tweeting out, I'm tweeting out of the podcast account right now at uh, okay. thought okay. underscore spiral. Thought underscore spiral. Okay. Wow. We'll keep... Uh, can we keep the audience on top of this? Uh, yeah, I'll try to keep you posted. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, meanwhile, uh, but, but otherwise, spiral, you can. Right? I have a I have a documentary called Michael DeBar, Who Do You Want Me to Be, which was also very well fact checked. Let me say, guy- <laughs> and, uh, it's fantastic. And, it is fantastic. And, and highly entertaining. I think I love that movie.
And, and if you had asked me who Michael DeBar was before I saw that movie, I don't think I could have told you. Now, if you'd no. shown me a picture it's of Michael of DeBar, fun. I would have gone, oh, that's that guy from all those different shows and all those right. different movies. I mean, in an instant, I would have recognized him. But the name, I didn't put with the face. And as it turns out, his life is fascinating. But more than that, I'll tell you, I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's really well done. That movie is super well done with a lot of appearances Thank from you. famous people and great interviews, and, and I, I really like it. So check it out. It's called Michael Day Barr. <laughs> Who do you want me to be? At uh, I always iTunes, do that. Amazon Prime. It's his running gag. It's a bit with my li- his running name. gag with my livelihood, ladies and gentlemen. Thing is, so I do that big build up, and you'd think I could remember the name of the movie, and then I can't remember it. I think that's funny. You know what I'm saying? Oh, come on. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I love you, Jay Elvis. Thank you for making time. You too, Michael Shore. You guys are really cool. Love you, kids. Likewise. Bravo. Thank All right. Talk to you soon. Right. Thank you. Bye. If you enjoy listening to The Edge, support them by subscribing to The Edge on iTunes, Stitcher, and you can listen through the iHeartRadio app. Get busy listening. This is The Edge with Mark Thompson. Jared Yates Sexton, your book is American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World but Failed Its People. And woven into this book is the myth of American exceptionalism and how an image and a sense of what life is in this country is sold to the people. You put specifics on it, how what is really happening is life in America has never really achieved the mythic state that's sold. Yeah. And, you know, the the truth is that from the very beginning of America, America was being sold to the world through the rhetoric of Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. It's all about freedom, liberty, equality, that we are exceptional and we're chosen. And meanwhile, you have the founding document, the Constitution, which is all about control by a wealth, white, wealthy, uh, slave-holding, aristocratic class. And so what you end up finding is that American history is divine, defined by the gap between the espoused principles and how the country has actually been founded, orchestrated, and run. And unfortunately, it's led to this moment of political and exercise existential crisis that we find ourselves in now. And we're in a position where we need to understand the divide between those uh, those vocalized principles and what we've actually worked from. I want to follow up on a couple of things that you've said, because clearly you're right on, it would seem, the level that would suggest the founding fathers were utter hypocrites. I mean, they're words which suggest, you know, all men are created equal. I mean, this is a, an avenue that's well-traveled, right? The notion is clearly absurd, given the fact that they Many of them owned slaves, and there were many among them, in fact, that had to broker deals with slave owners. It was a big part of the culture and the economy. But what about those who say, hey, look, there were a lot of abolitionists, like uh, Thomas Jefferson wasn't happy about the slave thing. I mean, I I think that 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 may be tortured logic because I don't even know that it's true. But but was there some of that? And might that be something to hang an argument on in terms of the fact that, uh, well, they were shooting for something, they were going for something, even though that wasn't being played out at the time? No, that is something that we can investigate because a- absolutely there were abolitionists and people who were anti-slavery. And I'm glad that you brought up Jefferson, who, of course, owned hundreds of human beings and generations of, of human beings. And this is a person who writes the Declaration of Independence. And one of the things that I discovered, which actually shocked me quite a bit, is the Declaration of Independence that we're all aware of and some of us are made to memorize in grade school is actually the second draft of the Declaration of Independence. And the first draft by Jefferson, who, of course, did own slaves, included a condemnation of human slavery, which seemed to set up the possibility of making slavery illegal and wiping it from America. But it was completely denied by the Congress. They decided that there was no way that they were going to maintain power and control without keeping the Southern states in slavery as part of America. So, and then we get to the Constitution. And in the words of the Founding Fathers, and this is something that anybody could look up today and and read for themselves, luckily James Madison kept copious notes from the so-called Constitutional Convention. And what you find is the Founding Fathers expressing in no uncertain terms, first of all, a belief in white supremacy, that white people are inherently better than people of color, but also the idea that only the wealthy and the powerful deserve representation or deserve to control the country. 
and a complete and utter disdain for common people who people like James Madison and the other framers actually believed needed to be controlled through the laws and through the government. This is a really provocative notion. When you state it, it makes total sense. I mean, look at the history. The white supremacy history of the U.S. is played out in all the laws that go into effect to, in essence, suppress the ability of those people of color to have a voice in the society. I mean, the extreme is the slavery, but I'm saying as the society has evolved, you see that voter suppression taking on different forms. So it makes perfect sense when you say it, that it was a fundamental American ideal. It absolutely was. And one of the things that we have to understand is that the Constitution, and this is also a weird part of history that doesn't appear in any of our textbooks or, you know, in our classrooms, uh, the, the framers of the Constitution actually were not authorized to write the Constitution. Uh, they were in Philadelphia to revise the Articles of Confederation. But James Madison and a group of Southerners decided to write this new Constitution in order to create a government of their own choosing. And in order to go ahead and pass it and make it out of this committee, this Constitution that wasn't even authorized in the first place, they have to make these concessions to the Southern states. And within the process, the southern states start to realize that they kind of have all of the power and all of the leverage of the Constitutional Convention. So, of course, we get things like the three-fifths compromise, but we also get things like the Electoral College. We get the Senate, which at the time was uh, directly appointed by the wealthy and the powerful. And so what we see in American history is that the beginning of American history is defined by the domination of the slaveholding South over American politics. Eventually, we make it to the Civil War. And American mythology says, of course, that white supremacy was wiped off the map whenever you know the Civil War ended. But what actually happened is that that racism and white supremacy was absorbed into our politics, our culture, and our law, and has continued to hide there ever since. The battles that we're having right now, both with Trumpism and the Republican Party, the Black Lives Matter conversation, it's about whether or not those things are fundamental to how America has operated and if they are still hidden in our laws, which they absolutely are. There is something else that you discuss, and I'm really glad you touch on it. In your book, you talk about the fact, and I'm just going to speak it in, in, in with my words, and then you can kind of modify them or completely erase them as necessary. You know, when you grow up in America, you have this sense that, you know, we're uh, liberty and justice for all, and we're trying to spread that around the world, you know? And the world wars allowed the U.S. to kind of dine out on that concept because we weren't really directly affected on our home turf. And by the time we got involved, obviously Pearl Harbor got us involved in our own turf, but I'm suggesting that we were liberating camps in Europe. And it seemed as though that the American GIs were associated with a righteous cause. But what you touch on in your book, and I, don't, I think that's indisputable, that we, we were associated with that. But as the years pass, you realize the other conflicts we get into, the Vietnam War, the Cold War, the military conflicts that the U.S. has involved itself in. I mean, where we really, where we send American troops and military supplies to various theaters of war, you see the complex relationship we have with the rest of the world and how that sort of dining out on freedom and liberty and spreading that, that really starts to run thin. It absolutely does. And one of the things that we've found uh, in this current moment, and this is why we're in this moment of crisis, is that the illusion of American exceptionalism is starting to flicker. We're starting to see through it. We're starting to understand that a lot of this is propaganda and it's a sale salesmanship, so to speak. And one of, the, one of the things that we have to examine, and this isn't comfortable, but it's absolutely true. You brought up, of course, World War II and beating back fascism. Well, we also have to examine the fact that there was a connection between America and the rise of fascism. We actually inspired a lot of Nazi Germany's laws, its philosophy. Adolf Hitler looked at our history of genocide, looked at our institutions of slavery and these hierarchical racial laws. A lot of our eugenicists went over to Germany and set up their system. So in a way, we actually beat back fascism. And, and by the way, as the grandson of a decorated veteran of World War II, I absolutely believe that our military in that conflict were heroes. But we were actually beating back a monster of our own creation, which in many ways is what has happened continually in America. Like, for instance, flashing forward to the idea of uh, the Persian Gulf War in Iraq. 
we were actually facing off against an army in Iraq that was armed with weapons that we had given them in order for them to fight Iran. So we have this cycle of America getting involved in other places around the world, and then these moments of blowback where we suddenly have to fight these situations and these movements that we helped create. But in order to fight that war, we have to make them the ultimate evil. We have to pretend like we're fighting Hitler all over again. And what we're actually doing is we're cleaning up our own messes that we have created in our desire to control world events. Not to mention that we began the Iraq incursion under false pretense, but that's for a different. I want to double back for a second to what you were saying about Hitler and the rise of fascism and the seeds of Hitler's fascism and fascism around the world, in some cases being sown by the U.S. You, you just rattled off a bunch of different things, the eugenics guys going over there. Will you just give me another second or two on that? That's fascinating to me. Yeah, and I have to tell you, when I discovered that, I wasn't expecting to when I was writing American Rule. You know, again, my idea of American history is is colored in many ways, not just by my education, but by popular culture and stories handed down in my family. But what you actually find is in the 20th century, earlier on, America becomes very obsessed with race and racial cleansing, and particularly the idea that there is good people and good breeding stock and bad stock. And so what you actually find in America is a movement towards eugenics, which is, of course, the idea that unworthy people should be sterilized and that worthy people should be encouraged to reproduce, that way to create some sort of master race, so to speak. And so we actually find in the 1920s especially, we find not just a movement towards eugenics, but we have a lot of uh, public philosophers and public intellectuals in America, uh, people like Lothrop Stoddard and Madison Grant, who write these books about how white supremacy is under attack. Well, they become international bestsellers in America and abroad, and they sort of form the intellectual basis of fascism and this idea that there is a white supremacy that should be aided by science and by uh, intentional genocide. And one of the things that we really don't like talking about, and I think this is really important considering our current moment, is that fascism was incredibly popular in the United States. In the 1930s, as we're being ravaged by the Great Depression, you have tons of fascists in America that gain in power and influence. You actually have in one place, in Madison Square Garden, a rally of American Nazis, roughly 20,000 of them. And you also have uh, the American First Party, which is helmed, of course, by the aviation hero Charles Lindbergh, who for a while was seen as a possible future president who in his speeches and his writings actually advocated for America to join Nazi Germany in protecting white supremacy, which would have put us, of course, on the side of the Axis powers. Well, of course, Pearl Harbor stops that, and, and we've just thrown a bunch of dirt on that and pretended like it never happened. But America has had these moments of fascistic uprisings, and it proves that not only are we immune to fascism, but we're particularly susceptible to it. Well, and I think it even goes beyond that. Based on what you've just said, I kind of feel as though we've covered it over, but it's still there. And now we're beginning to see some of it come to the surface. Yeah, and it's no coincidence that a lot of the slogans, catchphrases, and speeches that Charles Lindbergh would give to his fascist audiences have actually wholesale been lifted by the Donald Trump election campaign and re-election campaign. This is where uh, America First came from. This is where these appeals to uh, protecting Western civilization came from. And, you know, we... We have been so blind to what the idea of fascism is that in America we've had a rising neo-fascism for years. Uh, white supremacists and white terrorists have been carrying out attacks all over the country, um, You know, most notably, of course, in Oklahoma City with uh, Timothy McVeigh. But a lot of these mass shooters, a lot of these white terrorists, they're motivated by that same ideology. And right now with Donald Trump, we are seeing a leader who cultivates a, a – uh, a cult of personality with these people. And all of these calls, uh, these xenophobic calls, these paranoid conspiracy theories, unfortunately, these are all hallmarks of fascism. It's a bit scary. I see the rise of it. And I guess I want to ask you, is the media in any way amplifying it, making it easier, making it cooler, making it sexier, uh, giving it more of a voice than it deserves? I mean, certainly more of a voice than it deserves, but you know what I mean, more of a... Uh, 
more of a voice than it would have otherwise? In other words, giving it an oversized voice in the media culture? Unfortunately, it has. You know, in 2016, I believe it was $6 billion that the media gave Donald Trump in free advertising. And, and the whole point that I think that we really need to understand, and it's media, it's social media, it's politics in general, is that chaos, uncertainty, and fear are big money makers. Like, you know, Donald Trump, um, you know, lies about many things, but he has told the truth about a couple of things. And one is that the media is dependent on him. He has led to record breaking subscriptions, retweets, likes, views, ratings. And in that uncertainty, which is bad for America, which I, I believe it was Les Moonves who ran CBS said that Donald Trump may be bad for America, but he's great for CBS. And that mindset has actually led to an amplification and certainly on social media, we see that these companies are gaining not just off Donald Trump, but fascistic, racist, white supremacist conspiracy theories. This is where they make their, their money. This is where they gain the attention from. So something has to change. We have to move away from that culture of sensationalism and spectacle and find something that actually helps America and makes lives better. Jared, I want to ask you about a specific thing. We have limited time with you, so I just wanted to kind of get to a couple of things. You're such a good student of things beyond the myth that we're sold or beyond the image that we have. I want to go back to Ronald Reagan, because Ronald Reagan has an image that has, it would seem, every year elevated him to almost angelic status. It's remarkable to me the number of people who claim to be reagan Republicans. Like, that's a good brag. But the reality of the Reagan administration was awful for the middle class. It was awful for a lot of the regulatory agencies. It was a it was a disgrace, frankly. You're such a student of this stuff. What was Reaganism and how did it affect some of the stuff you're talking about? Well, first and foremost, I mean, this myth of what Reagan is, is, is a complete fabrication. And it's one of the reasons why the Republican Party has gone off the rails. The truth is that conservatism is dead. Uh, the Republican Party, beginning with Ronald Reagan, you know, they, they say that they're small government. Well, Ronald Reagan put the government in everything. Thing. They say that they're fiscally conservative. Well, Ronald Reagan ran up like record deficits, um, you know, and, and so what we actually saw with Reaganism was we saw a smiling face of trickle down, top down economics. Uh, Ronald Reagan, in a lot of ways, was the proto Trump. He had no idea what he was talking about. He worked very few hours. He read whatever was put in front of him, but he was pretty bored by being president outside of the ceremony of it. But he was made the, the pitch man for this new economy that would supposedly make everyone wealthy and rich and grow the middle class. But what it did was it created a reverse redistribution of wealth. And it took the money from the people and put it up to the wealthiest because they were believed to be the most competent, the most reliable people. Meanwhile, all of our social programs and our social safety net were completely shredded. And what happened, and the reason why we misremember Reagan and why he's grown into this, can actually be found in a lot of memos. You can go online and find them today if you want. They're old re-election strategy memos from the Reagan re-election campaign where Reagan's people decided that the right strategy was to make Ronald Reagan synonymous with America, to make him the embodiment of all of American myth. And what they were able to do is they were able to resell to the American public this idea of exceptionalism, which, of course, had been harmed during Watergate and Richard Nixon and the stagflation of the 1970s. Ronald Reagan comes along and basically becomes not just a mascot, but a revivalist preacher of American exceptionalism. So that's what the right has run on. And in a way, the left has even had to embrace the Reagan mythology and pretend like what he was selling the American people was somehow or another real or beneficial when it was actually completely artificial and harmful to everyone. I love that take. I love the last thing you said, particularly, where you talk about the left having to embrace it. It gets so much momentum that after a while, it, it, it seems unpatriotic almost not to celebrate Ronald Reagan, even though you know the realities are what you have just outlined. I feel there might be a, there may be a little bit of that in the moment that we've just seen this week as we talk. Joe Biden, who may win if they respect the popular vote as it factors into the electoral college, et cetera. And you know, I'm, I'm keeping it independent of court challenges. If that anyway, if that vote and the people's voice is heard, it would seem he's polling way ahead of Donald Trump as though he might uh, 
he might win the presidency. But uh, I mention this in the context of his cabinet, which is now being vetted and including yeah. Republican names, some of them very high profile. And what I feel that does is it reframes the lunacy of the right. Now, this is my bias. Yeah. I mean, I, I just feel the, the, the right is crazy uh, with with power right now. We've seen what's happened. You're taking many of these people who've essentially been uh, co-conspirators to a Trump presidency, and you're now integrating them, or at least representing the potential of integrating them, into your administration that reframes them as less crazy than they are. Yes, and, and I wish that we had like three or four hours to talk about this, because this is the crux of what is happening in the political moment. Uh, a, a brief moment of history, and again, this is something I didn't understand until I wrote American Rule, but Reagan was so popular that after he won re-election and just won it in an absolute landslide, the Democratic Party got together and decided that they could never win another election unless they embraced Reaganism. And so this is where we come up with this idea of what is now called neoliberalism, which sounds like it's something on the left, but it actually began with Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. And so you see the Democratic Party make this decision, and Bill Clinton was part of this with the Democratic Leadership Council, where the Democratic Party basically decides that they have to embrace Reagan while putting a smiling, happy face on Reaganism. So you actually see the Democratic Party move right. And by the way, part of that movement was Joe Biden, who has been You know, this is why you see Democrats always acting like they're tough on crime or they're not afraid of wars is because they have to somehow or another reach this level of Reaganism that makes them seem patriotic and strong and capable. Well, in this moment, what you're talking about reframing what the right has done you're actually seeing the left in a lot of ways do this. They're embracing, of course, uh, the group known as Project Lincoln, which is or Lincoln Project, which is all of the Republicans who made all of the ads for the Republicans who you know have won over the previous years. We're now talking about bringing in John Kasich within the administration of Joe Biden. And what we're actually doing is we are normalizing what the Republican Party has become, when in fact the Republican Party has shown that it's not only dangerous, but it acts only in bad faith and self-interest. It needs to go away, like the Whigs or the Federalist. It needs to be replaced by some other conservative alternative, because it has been riddled through with bad faith politics that doesn't even actually believe the principles that it espouses. I think that that's exactly right. It's infuriating this week as we speak to have to be talking about this. I always call Joe Biden. He's a Republican. I don't understand why he's running with the Democrats, but but I understand. Well, I, I come I at tell it. You, yeah. Well, I'll just say, I think in a world that made sense, someone like a Joe Biden would be the Republican nominee for president. And you would have a leftist challenger who would be talking about, you know, dealing with the economy and, and social services and stuff like that. But the right has moved so far right that it has actually drugged the Democratic Party within the realm of the Republican Party. So what will you see now, because everyone still sees it as blue and red, Democrat, Republican, liberal and conservative, isn't actually the reality anymore. It's been completely shifted to the point where it's almost unrecognizable and, and not even able to be understood under those old dichotomous ideas. I love talking to you, Jared Yates Sexton. I'm going to put a link to your book on our website and wherever you're listening on whatever platform, there should be a link. That link is hot and it will take you to American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World but Failed Its People from Jared Yates Sexton. As we finish, you're a creative writing professor at Georgia Southern University? That's correct. I, can I tell you a quick story, Jared, and then I'll, let you, Absolutely. then I'll let you roll. Okay, so when I was in high school, I took a creative writing class. and I'll just never forget this. There was this huge guy. In fact, he was like my bodyguard. I grew up in Washington, D.C., and so I was the only white kid on the bus, and unfortunately there was a lot of racial stuff at the time. But but Raymond, this guy Raymond, was a huge dude, and he was my bodyguard sort of. Like nobody messed with me (laughs) because I was with Raymond. Anyway, this guy Raymond, this huge dude, he's in my creative writing class, and I forget what the assignment was, but there comes a time when you're supposed to read parts of your writing. Do you have that in your class where people read it? Oh, yeah, the workshop. Absolutely. Okay, so during the time that they're reading it, we go around the room. Most of it's pretty innocuous and pretty forgettable. And Raymond starts reading this scene. And about 90 seconds to two minutes in, you realize, oh, my God, this is an explicit sex scene. He is describing a sexual encounter and he is doing it with the language of, of frankness about sex, you know? And 
I remember looking at the teacher, who was this woman probably in, in the range of 65 to 70, and looking around the room, and people's faces were just ashen, you know? And then he ended it, and she didn't even comment at all. Like, she didn't say, well, that was certainly a daring piece of material or whatever. <laughs> Nothing. It was terrific. I'll never forget it as long as I live. It was amazing. Have you ever had a moment in your class? Do people ever take on sort of radioactive stuff like that? Every now and then you just have to move forward. That's a, <laughs> that's a general rule. And I assume as an interviewer, you understand that. Sometimes I'm, you have to blink a couple of times and move forward. I can't wait to get into the book completely. And I would love to have you on the radio, too. In fact, I may lift part of this for use on the radio. I would love that literally any time. Thank you so okay. much. Terrific. American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World but Failed Its People. Jared Yates Sexton. Thanks, Jared. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed the conversations with Jay Elvis, with Michael Shore, with Jared Yates Sexton. Thank you for subscribing, for sharing this podcast. And the email address is edgewithmarkthompson at gmail.com. Until next time, bye-bye.